All right. Big comeback stream. Big comeback. I made it, guys. I freaking made it. <clears throat> Sorry, I gotta. I had to reframe some things. Um. Can't do this. There it is. Uh, friends, Dang it. size this. Too much, maybe. <laughs> it's too much. Too. No. Oh. Better. All right. Chapter four. Hafiz, what's up, man? Salam. How you doing, man? You're having a good Ramadan. Hope the noble struggle is in full effect. Can I please zoom into this? Why doesn't it let me? Zoom. Do it. Let me do it, huh? Busted. Yep. That's good. That's good. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, all right. Give it a few more minutes. Started kind of early today. I haven't used Edge again for this. My other program took a dump, so we'll see. See how this works. It'd be nice if I could. Make. Oh, I don't know. Waiting for prayer time. Nice man. It's right on. Right on. I think I'm gonna uh, use the restroom real quick. We'll get started. I figure this is the kind of stuff that should be streaming. If I'm going to be honoring to Muslim uh, bros and and sisses, it's been rough. It's been a rough uh, couple weeks though for me. But 
back at it. So much controversy, man. So much controversy. Hide this. Yeah, I can hide. It's on the correct one still, right? Yes. Nice timestamps, huh? Yeah, let me use the restroom real quick. Back. Why can't it be so much small? That's good. That's real good. Um. <clears throat> Be back. I'm back. Psychor, what's up? Can't hear anything? That's because there was nothing. Let's go. Wasn't you, it was me. What's up, Maddie? How you doing, man? All right. We left off on chapter four, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Medi, can you confirm that? All good here, bro. Missing this miss this reading. You've been out too long. Yeah, no, man. I, I apologize. Like I said, I had some health scares. I had some issues with insurance, like trying to get proper care. It's a nightmare, dude. The American healthcare system is such a freaking nightmare. So I'm sorry for the hiatus. And then, dude, there's like a lot of drama. Just the fact that I'm doing what I'm doing, uh, like from both sides. Like I went on a Christian stream who there was, you know, there was I, I was asking some questions about you know, their perceptions of Islam and stuff like that. And I mean, it turned to be, it turned out to be pretty polemical, um, which is that, so it's okay. You know, I'm, I'm used to, you know, people being very firm in their, in their, in their positions, but <clears throat> I got on one side from, from, um, a couple people, I got some pretty bad hate, 
um, not really actually from, I would be honest from the Muslim side, not really that bad of hate. you know, they were just like, Whoa, dude, you know, you're, you're just being a chameleon or whatever. The accusations were far worse from the Christian side. And it's been hard for me to deal with that because I'm super prone to stress because of my health issues. And so I, there was part of me that had wanted to take a break from that. I was like, should I even be doing this? Like, should I even be, you know, talking to people, you know, um, about these kind of spiritual journeys? Cause it's really complex and nuanced chapter four, but and then plus the health issues, I was like, I, I don't know, man. I was there was part of me that wanted to just abandon the whole endeavor, um, like even right now, just because of the whole Dr. Brown, um, I can't remember the other gentleman's name, the Muslim uh, gentleman's name from Muslim Debated Initiative, I made a comment on there, and I said that it was incorrect the way that some people were posting the video preemptively before Muslim Debate Initiative got got to post it, and they're like, "You're not even Christian. I saw you on Hamza stream. You're a liar. You know your name is Wolfenhouse, which means wolf in the house, which means wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> like it's really intense. Even though you are not a Muslim, we are just we are just and will defend even those who are direct brothers and sisters. Don't abandon. I appreciate that, man. No, it's bad, dude. It's bad. Like your entire personhood gets called into question by these like no face people online and it's hard i've never dealt with something like this before so it's like geez dude people can be really ruthless and i was like i'll prove it like i prove i'm catholic i can prove that i was eastern orthodox i can't really prove that i was protestant like how would i really go about doing that like i said all i had was my book my book stash a little bit of them my selection of readings that kind of proves that but you know i can't really prove i'm protestant i don't really have any pictures with like a pastor or something like that but I do have pictures with my priests. I do have pictures in Orthodox churches. I have pictures at my confirmation for my for for my, with my Catholic priest. It's just weird, dude. I told him I'd be happy to prove it. And you can hop on stream and talk to me about it. <laughs> but I doubt that that'll happen. Anyways, I digress. Let's get back to the reading. Chapter four: The World of the Book. I seen to the wedding myself. Yeah, see, that's kind of weird, right? <laughs> really? Yeah, you seen to you was there. <clears throat> you was there. Where was that at? Oh, that was at an Orthodox church before I was Catholic. Oh, weird. The whole church was all actors. It's all, <laughs> yeah, dude. It's all some massive, massive Muslim scandal. Like I'm this, you know, <laughs> this, this white American from the countryside, you know, who's got a totally understandable story, but no, I'm actually a Muslim actor. I've been paid by the Dawah scene. I've been paid by the Saudis. Crazy. All right. <laughs> I digress. Chapter four, the world of the book. There is ground to be cleared before we can have any hope of coming close to the Quran. Thorny ground, all the more difficult to negotiate because of the, th because the thorn trees are not immediately visible. In every religious tradition and in every ancient legend, sacred things and sacred places are closely guarded, approachable only through effort and purification. The Quran is no exception. So far, uh, so far as the Occidental's misunderstandings of Islam uh, is concerned, it starts here at the source of the religion. For those who don't remember, Occident means like the, uh, the he put it colloquially, the white man's world, right? It would be nice, big green, dude, I know. <laughs> Who, I mean, you know, would I turn it down? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I do need the money. I am almost disabled. <laughs> I did take a walk, though. And my friend, uh, Angry, was, egg was uh, egging me on by take for taking the walk and being more fit. So, that's good. I say it could have done with PowerPoint. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, the non-Muslim who, for whatever reason, wishes to learn something about Islam is encouraged to take in his hands a translation of the Quran, of which there are said to be at least 30 in English alone. He has been told, and rightly so, that this book is the foundation of the faith, and that in it he will find all he needs to know about the Muslim, his beliefs, his motivation, his political aspirations, and his cultural conditioning. The reader may set off uh, with the best intentions, seeking wisdom as he understands this term and aware that a, a book which has meant so much to so many cannot be devoid of interest. The outcome is uh, only too often bafflement and disappointment. There is nothing here that accords with the Occidental sense of order. On the contrary, he finds only a world of words which seems totally incoherent and to which he has no key. 
We have come yet again to the gulf of incomprehension which divides two religions, two mentalities, and two cultures. On the one hand, the simple Muslim uh, cannot understand why anyone who reads the Quran is not immediately converted to Islam. On the other, the non-Muslim is inclined to feel that if this is what Muslims regard as sacred scripture, then they must be indeed simple-minded. Since many of those who set out to read the Quran uh, in translation give up before they are halfway through the book, the order in which the surahs, the chapters as they say, are arranged reinforces this negative impression. The revelation of the text took uh, a place over a period of 22 uh, or 23 years. Uh, the, early, the earlier and more poetic revelations came towards the end of the book, whereas the later ones there quickly, yeah. Whereas the later ones dealing with what are seen as mundane issues are placed at the beginning. The former approximate more closely to what the Occidental expects, since uh, since they are former pro approximate more closely to what the Occidental ex uh, expects, since they are prophetic in character and language, dealing with the end of the world, final destiny of man, and so on. Whereas in the latter, the element message overshadows the element prophecy. <clears throat> Thus, the book presents a mere image of the of the process of revelation or descent. The reason for this the reason for this may be that man, in responding to the revelation and following the way of ascent, is which he is called, starts out from the realm of practical affairs and needs to know who to behave in this worldly life before he sets foot on the path which leads beyond this world. There, there is. Oh, yeah. I don't know Dr. Brown's really opinion about the Quran. I just know his... Uh... ...person. Pretty, pretty well-versed in, like, biblical. Um, but anyways, uh, from my understanding, I don't know really a lot about it. There is, however, a more formidable barrier which faces the reader of a translation of the Quran, the barrier of language. The power and efficacy of the revealed message reside not only in the literal meaning of the words employed, but also in the body in which this meaning is incorporated. It is, it is not only the content, but also the container that, constitu that constitutes the revelations as such. And the two cannot be separated, as they are in translation without impoverishment. The Quran defines itself specifically as an Arabic scripture, and the message is shaped to the complex structure of the chosen language, Structure fundamentally different to that of any European tongue. Even if one understands no Arabic, as is the case with the vast majority of Muslims, it is essential to know how meaning, language, essence, and form are married in the text of the Quran. Every Arabic word may be traced back to a verbal root consisting of three consonants from which are derived up to 12 different verbal modes, together with a number of nouns and adjectives. This is referred to as the triliteral root. Specific words are formed from it, by the insertion of long or short vowels, by the addition of suffixes. The root of such is dead, unpronounceable until brought to life, that is to say, vocalized by the vowels, and it is, a, it is according to their place that the basic meaning is developed in a number of different sections. The root has sometimes been described as the body, while the voweling is the soul, or again, it is the root that, that a great tree grows. In Arabic, says Titus Burkhardt, the tree of verbal forms of, de de of derivations from certain roots is quite inexhaustible. It can always bring forth new leaves, new expressions to represent hitherto dormant variations of basic idea or action. This explains why this Bedouin tongue was able to become the linguistic vehicle of an entire civilization intellectually very rich and differentiated. Certain ambiguity is inherent <clears throat> in, in language as such. Uh, because it is alive and forms a bridge between living and thinking things. The opposite to the bare precision of mathematics is not vagueness of definition, but a wealth of interconnected meaning, sometimes merging into one another, always enriching each other, with clust which cluster around a single basic idea, or in Arabic, a simple action. In this, in this case, the trilateral root, such variations upon a single... Upon a single theme may give rise to words which appear on the surface unconnected. Awareness of their relationship to their root makes the connection apparent, so that the whole extended family of words is 
This may be illustrated in terms of a word referred to earlier, fitra, primordial nature. The root FTR <laughs> gives us in the first place the verb fatara, meaning uh, he split or he broke apart, he brought forth or created. The connection between splitting and creating is interesting, especially if we bear in mind the L continuity so characteristic of this. Ancient traditions from many different cultures describe the first step in creation as the breaking apart of heaven and earth. God is referred to in the Quran as the Batir Asamawati Wal Wal Walard? Walar? I don't, I'm sorry for butchering that. Uh, creator or originator of the heavens and earth. From the same root, we have the uh, Id ul -fit Fitr, <clears throat> the festival which which marks the end of the sacred month of Ramadan, and iftar, meaning breakfast. Among other derivations, are, there are fatr, a cracker fisher, fitri, natural or instinctive, and fit, uh, fat, fatara, unleavened bread or pastry, fresh and life-giving. It is as though each individual word emerged from a matrix which contains... Can you reduce the filter? Oh, okay. Yeah. Probably the noise. Try messing up. Um, let's turn it. If I just remove the filter in general. All right, let me know how this goes. It's not picking up any background noise, so... Yeah, it's probably, like I said, it's probably the noise gate. Let me know how this sounds. Does this sound better? Here, I'll read like through a little bit of it. It is as though each individual word emerged from a matrix, which contains potentially a variety of meanings that are all subtly interrelated. Or as though when one string is plucked, many others vibrate in the background. And it is precisely through such inter interrelationships that uh, Tawheed, or the unity, which is the basic principle of Islam, finds expression in the midst of limitless diversity. Word associations, echoes, and reverberations in the ear and in the mind provide a glimpse of unsuspected depths and extend our perception of the interconnectedness of things. According to Muhammad, <clears throat> there is no verse in the Quran which does not have an inner as well as an outer aspect, together with a number of different meanings, and every definition is potentially a source of this enlightenment. Fahad, what's up, man? Is that better, uh, Mehdi? Did that co correct the problem? Yeah, it was definitely the noise gate then. Ibrahim, what's up, man? Well, like salam, brother. How you doing? Yeah, then that's what it was. It was the noise gate, which uh, since I've got my little pop filter on here now, that's probably going to be a lot less of an issue. So I probably don't even need it because when I stop talking. Yeah, I'm not getting any background noise. I'll probably get some if I type. Maybe. But that's fine. I'm not typing when I'm doing this. So no big deal. <clears throat> um, potentially a source of enlightenment. In other words, uh, the book is full of doors out of the prison of this world into the open. Islamic art bears witness to this. Writing of the significant significance of the palmets, palmetes. Yeah, you can't really see it from the backside, but it's like a, like I said, it's like a little pop filter. So that I don't, the, the mic already had a pop filter on it, but they said adding another one helps out a lot. <clears throat> And since my wife has like a little YouTube channel, she gets like little free things to test out. And that was one of them. They gave it to her for free. <laughs> so even though it was like 10 bucks, but uh, yeah, palmettes, palmettes, little palm trees placed in the margins of illuminated copies of the Quran. Martin Lings identifies them as reminders that the reading or chanting of the Quran is the virtual starting point of a limitless vibration, a wave that ultimately breaks on the shore of eternity, and it is above all that shore that is signified by the margin, which, or excuse me, towards which all the movement of the painting in palmette, fi finial crenellation, and flow of the arabesque is directed. That was a lot of, I don't know what crenellation and Arab, I mean, Arabesque, meaning like the essence of Arab. Weird. I don't know what those stuff, that stuff means. 
It is in the nature of a primordial language such as Arabic that a single word should imply all possible modes of an idea, from the concrete to the symbolical and indeed the supernatural. The barriers which Occidental man places between the spiritual and the mundane are, as it were, pierced by the language itself. An effort of the imagination is required of those accustomed only to English or other hybrid languages in which a noun indicates a thing in isolation from all others. If they wish, if they wish to enter the world of the Quran, not only were the language or the objects of nature saturated with meaning for the men of earlier times, but language itself reflected this richness. And it is said that the Arabic of the 7th century AD was more ancient in form even than he, the Hebrew spoken by Moses nearly 2,000 years previously. It is imbued with the qualities which lie outside all our frames of reference and all our limited de limiting de definitions. And it is this, above all, that made it the appropriate vehicle for the revelation of unity in multiplicity. That's from Martin Ling. That's cool, the, one of those quotes from Martin Ling's. He's another one of those perennialist guys. <clears throat> perennialist traditionalist guys. It follows that a translation, however, ex however excellent, it may be in its own way and however useful as an aid to understanding is not and cannot be the Quran and it is not treated as such. No Muslim will place a copy of the Arabic Quran under other books or beneath any object on, on a desk or table. It must always occupy the highest space. We may do as we please with a translation and this, uh, st and this, and this would still be so even if it conveyed the principles of the Quranic message with impeccable accuracy. The distinction between uh, revelation and inspiration, even, insp even inspiration, which has its origin in the divine, is of fundamental importance in Islam. And this can be another cause of confusion for the Occidental, who has been told that the Quran is the Muslim Bible, quote-unquote. Will I do a series on reading the Quran and giving thought and, and opinions? It's a lofty task. Maybe, maybe, if, we could, maybe if we could space out, like like sections that we wanted me to read or something because like reading the whole quran that's i mean that's a long that would be a long read i mean even this we're almost halfway through this book already and it's pretty we've only done four sessions of about an hour but um if maybe people could like and i have the study quran as well as the clear quran read it personally first yeah <clears throat> Then we can do it collectively. Right on. Uh, yeah, but it, it would be fine. It's just, um, like I said, it would be, it, we would have to structure it in a way that like makes sense. So I don't have a problem with it at all. It would just be, like I said, it would just need structure. Um, but yeah, I probably should, I probably should get through the entirety of it on my, on my own. Oh, nice that even the angels gather and listen to the Quran. It's cool. Uh, the Old Testament contains material attributable to a number of different authors extending over a very long period of time, sometimes directly inspired and sometimes indirectly, while the New Testament is comparable to such traditions of the prophet, such traditions of the prophet, his acts and sayings, rather than to the Quran as such. The Bible is a coat of many colors. The Quran is a single fabric to which nothing can be added from which nothing can be abstracted. In the Muslim view, <laughs> revelation bypasses human intelligence and the limit limitations of that intelligence, whereas inspiration enlightens intelligence but does not abolish its limitations. As inspired work is still a work of human authorship. The orthodox view in Islam is that the Quran is uncreated, although, although as the book we hold in our hands, its mode of expression is necessarily determined by human contingencies. The celestial Quran, the fullness of wisdom that is with God and remains with him everlastingly, contains intentions which, in our earthly experience, may be expressed through a variety of created facts and events. It is as though a heavenly substance, itself inarticulate, were crystallized in a language and in modes of thought determined by its predestined milieu." There is, however, an incalculable, incalculable disproportion between the truth as such and the slender resources of human language and of the mentalities to which it, it relates. Even in the most ordinary circumstances, we as human creatures find it difficult enough to express our deepest feelings in speech with any degree of accuracy, or to convey to other people the precise outlines of ideas which are quite clear in our minds. 
I'm going through this right now. <laughs> Very clearly. That's awesome. Even though this speech is a tool fitted for, to our needs. How much more difficult then for God to express the wealth of meaning he wishes to convey in the language of men? It is shredded, it bends, it cracks and cracks under this burden, and we find again and again in the Quran unfinished sentences or the omission of words required to complete the sense of a passage, words usually supplied in brackets by the translators. Gaps over which our understanding must make a leap into the in the dark. It is, says Friedolf Schuon, as though the poverty stricken coagulation, which this which is the language of mortal man, were under the formidable uh, pressure of the heavenly word, broken into a thousand fragments, or as if God, in order to express a thousand truths, had but a dozen words at his command, and so was compelled to make use of allusions heavy with meaning of ellipsis, abridgments, and symbolical synthesis. <coughs> And if all the trees on earth were pins, and the sea and with seven seas added, yet the words of Allah could not be exhausted. For the Quran, <clears throat> to contain more than a thimbleful of the message, it must rely upon images, symbols, and parables, which open windows uh, on to a vast landscape of meaning, but which are inevitably liable to misinterpretation. The Prophet's wives once asked him, which of them would be the first to die? The one with the longest arm, he said. <clears throat> they set about measuring each other's arms with, this, with great seriousness, and not, not, and not until long afterwards did they understand that he meant that the one who extended her arm the uh, furthest in acts of charity. There have always been Muslims who, like the Prophet's wives, have taken figures of speech literally, and others who have maintained that the inner meaning of the text will be revealed to us only on the last day. When the secrets of hearts are exposed together and the secrets of the book, others, again, have regarded the literal meaning as a veil covering the majesty of the content and protecting it from profane eyes. The disputes which have arisen on this subject lead nowhere and are therefore a no, of no consequence. Each man must, fo must follow his own way according to his nature. But in whatever sense it may be understood, superficially or in depth, a scripture such as the Quran provides a rope of salvation for people of every kind, the stupid as well as the intelligent. <laughs> and limited interpretations do not diminish its efficacy, provided they satisfy the needs of particular souls. No book of human authorship can be for everyone, but that is precisely the function of a revealed scripture, and for this reason it cannot be read in the way that works of human origin are read. The sun and the moon are for everyone, the rain too, but their action in relation to each individual is different, and ultimately, to some, they bring life and to some death. It could be said that the Quran is like these natural phenomena, but it would be more exact to say that they are like the Quran. They have one and the same author, and are, as it were, illustrations inserted between the pages of the book. It is an article of faith in Islam that the Quran is inimitable. <clears throat> Try as he may, no man can write a paragraph that he is com that is comparable with a verse of the revealed book. This has little to do with the literary merit of the text. It, in fact, a perfect work of literature can never be sacred precisely on account of the adequacy of its language to its content. No conjunction of words, however excellent, could ever be adequate to a revealed contour. <clears throat> It is the efficacy of the words, their transforming and saving power, that is inimitable, since no human being can provide others with a rope of salvation made from strands of his own person and his own thoughts. The Quran set on a shelf with other books has a function entirely different from theirs and exists in a different dimension. It moves an illiterate shepherd to tears when recited to him, and it has shaped the lives of millions of simple people over the course of almost 14 centuries. It has nourished some of the most powerful intellects known to the human record. It has stopped sophisticates in their tracks and made saints of them. And it has been the source of the most subtle philosophy and of art, which expresses its deepest meaning in visual terms. It has brought the wandering tribes of mankind together in communities and civilizations upon which its imprint is apparent even to the most casual observer. The Muslim, regardless of race and national identity, is unlike anybody else, anyone else, because he has undergone the impact of the Quran and has been formed by it. Other books are passive. The reader taking the initiative, but revelation is an act, a command from on high, comparable to a lightning flash, which obeys no man's whim. As such, it acts upon those who are responsive to it, reminding them of their true function as vice-regents of God on earth, <clears throat> restoring to them 
the use of faculties which have become atrophied, like unused muscles, and showing them, not least by their example of the prophet, what they are meant to be. It is it's, To say this is to say that revelation within the limits of what is possible in our fallen condition restores to us the condition of fitra. It gives back to the intelligence its lost capacity to perceive and to comprehend supernatural truths. It gives back to the will, the, to the will its lost capacity to command the warring factions of the soul. And it gives back to sentiment its lost capacity to love God and to love everything that reminds us of Him. It can never be said that the Quran does not exist to inform. Indeed, the book itself asserts that this is one of its functions, but it is very much more than a source of information. It exercises its effects not only upon the mind, but on the very substance of the believer. Although it can do this only in its integral character, that is to say, an Arabic Quran. For the listener, the sound, and for the reader, the script have a profound transforming effect. The modernist would no doubt suggest that this effect is exercised upon the unconscious. This is to introduce the ideas and theories which have no place here, but it could be said but it could be said there is an effect upon regions of the personality which are in practice concealed from the conscious thought or control. Again, when we refer to the human substance, what is meant is not merely the sum total of our faculties, but also the substratum, which finds expression in these faculties. Because the Quran is the divine word in which we, were, we ourselves originated, it is able to fill every crevice of our being, and in a sense, to replace the debris which previously filled that space with something of heavenly origin. The prophet said, A believer who recites the Quran is like a citron whose fragrance is sweet and whose taste is sweet. And he, and he, and he said that also that he who learns it and goes to sleep having it within him is like a bag with musk tied in it, <clears throat> tied up in it. When he told his companions that hearts become rusty just as iron does when water gets at it, and they asked him how this rust was removed, he, pro he replied by frequent remembrance of death and frequent recitation of the Quran. According to Ibn Masud, a companion of the Prophet, anyone who has learned the Quran and holds it lovingly in his heart will value his nights when people are asleep, his days when people are given to excess, his grief when people are joyful, his weeping when people laugh, his silence when people chatter, and his humility when people are arrogant. In other words, every moment of his life will be precious to him, and he should therefore be gentle, never harsh nor quarrelsome, not one who makes a clamor in the market, nor one who is quick to anger. The Quran, says Friedhof Schuon, is like a world of multiplicity which leads directly to the underlying wait, wait, wait. The underlying unity. The soul which is accustomed to the flux of phenomena yields to this flux without resistance. It lives in phenomena, and it is by them divided and dispersed. The revealed discourse has the virtue that accepts this tendency, while at the same time reversing the, lang the movement on account of the celestial nature of the content and, of the, and the language, so that the fishes of the soul swim without distrust and with their habitual rhythm into the divine net. The Quran is like a picture of everything the human brain can think and feel, and it is by this means that God exhausts human disquiet, infusing into the believer silence, sincerity, and peace. The faithful Muslim, therefore, lives simultaneously in two worlds. The first is that a common experience and the business of time. <clears throat> uh, the second, uh, which he enters when, and as a newborn baby, he hears the words of the Shahada recited in his ear is the world of the book. As a child, he learns sections of the Quran. He recites it in his prayers when he is old enough to pray, and if he is fortunate, he dies listening to its recital. At the same time, the world of common experience is vivified by the Quranic formulas constantly introduced into everyday speech. Assalamu alaikum. Last time you saw me was on a stream with Jake and, uh, Jake and Daniel. No, I haven't. I haven't converted yet. Just we're just re going. We're just reading, man. Got a lot to learn still. Uh, hold on one sec. Uh, I gotta check on the baby real quick. Crazy reading though. A lot to digest. One sec, guys.
Oh, that little one just making a mess. Constant messy. Hi. Hey. Yeah, you know you did bad by making that messy, huh? She's all like depressed. She hates the way when I the way that I look at her when she makes a mess. She just like feels so ashamed, and so she's coming in here trying to. Did you get her funk glasses yet? <laughs> She's, uh, yeah, I, well, I, I retrofitted a, a old pair that I had. You want your bottle? Or you want a sippy cup? Oh, I don't got any milk for you. We need to go get milk. You want juice? I don't like you drinking juice, but I'll use it in a pinch. Hang on one second. I gotta go get her some. Get her a little bit of, a little bit of juice watered down. Muted. Oops. <laughs> Oops. I was saying, what's up, Assad? Thanks, Zico, for the well wishes. I was just reading what everybody was saying. Thanks, guys. Sorry. It's one thing that, like, with this pop filter, it's great, but I can't as easily see the r big red indicator on it. <laughs> No shahada yet? No, man, no. No. No shahada yet, although I was proud of Bobby, man. I was definitely proud.
All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Like I said, anybody who wasn't here, sorry for being away. It's just been pretty rough in both a mental and a mentally and physically and spiritual kind of way. will never not be not be funny yeah no do no joke but i'm proud of him I'm proud of him for I'm crazy and he did it with um shake Uthman like that i heard he was really struggling with his health uh and i heard a little bit of it that he um he got the uh the flu the um the infamous flu as we'll call it the infamous infamous cold and it really messed him up and that's exactly my story too um, yeah, I got horribly, it was so weird because I wasn't, he got really sick. I wasn't that sick, but all of my symptoms started after I got sick. So I had a very light cold. I was only sick for about three days and then it was about five to seven days. I can't remember for sure, for sure, which one it was, but all of my horrible neurological symptoms have to, happened around after that time, about five to seven days after. And I've suffered really poorly ever since I've never, I haven't been diagnosed like he was with an autoimmune dis, uh, disorder. Um, but yeah, it really jacked me up. It's uh, it's really unfortunate that um, that he, he can he was kind of one of those people that was very you can look at his telegram and stuff. He's very critical of the vaccines and he's very critical of like the whole COVID thing. And then he got his butt kicked really bad by it. And I was kind of in the same kind of in the same milieu. Although I was I was skeptical of both. I thought COVID was very excuse me, I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> I thought the flu was very dangerous as well, and I thought the shots were very dangerous as well. But so I was kind of stuck in the middle. But I don't know, man. It's terrible. It's really, really horrible. I'm really sorry that he's suffering through that. God bless him and make it easy for him. So I'm sure people are just going to call me, even because of the similarity between him and I situation. We're just both grifters. We're both just liars. <laughs> I'll be lumped in with him. I had a guy tell me that it's be I claimed I was Catholic because it gave me more authenticity today in the comments of uh, the MDI debate that I was lying, saying I was Catholic because somehow when I take my Shahada, that will make it more sincere. You had to get four shots due to your job. Yeah, like I said, mine was after I caught the illness. It wasn't the it wasn't after the 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 shots that made me ill. So I don't know. It was about four months after I had my single shot that I got four to five months, and then I got ill. It was in November November eleventh when I got my first dose. I thought that was going to be sufficient. I didn't want to test it even further because I heard about negative side effects. So I was like, one shot should be enough. And then I got sick about four in in the end of uh, January, early February. So you know extra credit, right? <laughs> oh, after the first, okay, you got the C. Yeah, we'll call it the C. That's good. That's a good, good uh, alliteration. <laughs> Basit, my dude. What's up, man? Thanks for being here. All right, I guess we'll continue. Well, like I'm Salam. The Westerner, whether Christian or agnostic, says, thank God or goodbye, God be with you, or even God willing. But these words have for the most part been emptied of meaning. There are many decadent Muslims who use Quranic phrases in an equally thoughtless way, but there is little doubt that the vast majority, when they say Alhamdulillah, which is God be praised, know exactly what they are saying and mean it. This phrase ends and sanctifies every action, just as the Basmillah, um, which is in the name of, uh, of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, inaugurates action. Allahu Akbar, which is like a paraphrase of the first Shahada, indicates not only that God is most great, but also that he is incomparably greater than any imaginable greatness. Under the possible circumstances, it reminds us of the significance of the human before the divine, the weakness of the mightiest human power before omnipotence, and the littleness of everything that is other than God. It may also express the, uh, the awe with which the pious man feels like he looks upon the wonders of creation, and without a sense of awe, there is no piety. Uh, 
Oh, gotcha. The little C, not the big C. Thanks, man, for the blessings. Bobby already has, has already embraced. Yeah, to be fair, though, he was studying a lot longer than I was. But yeah, I agree. I, I appreciate it. I know you, what you're saying is, is in, in sincerity and kindness. Ah, man, this, this scroll, it's too fast. <clears throat> By the words, inshallah, God willing, the Muslim recognizes his total dependence upon the divine will and acknowledges that he can make no firm plans nor commit himself irrevocably to any course, since he is not the master of his own destiny. We may express an intention or a hope, but no valid predictions uh, can be made regarding future events still hidden in the womb of the unseen and known only to God. This is, uh, this and other such phrases punctuating every conversation are like little flags, reminders of transcendence pinned on a wall, on a wall map along the route we, along the route we take between birth and death, adding an extra dimension to, uh, to its otherwise flat surface. The believer is commanded not to approach the Quran in haste. But as he is told not to run, to, uh, not to run to communal prayer to the communal prayers, even if he is the last joining the congregation, for it is said that slowness and deliberation come from God, whereas haste is of satanic origin. Oh, that's interesting. <clears throat> In the surah called uh, Al Al Farqan, the definition of true Muslims includes those who, whenever they are reminded of their Lord's messages, do not fling themselves upon them as if deaf and blind. Who, in the words of the commentator Zemek. Semakshari, listen to it and with wide awake ears and look into it with seeing eyes. The Quran holds up a mirror to those who approach it, and if they come to it for the wrong reasons or in the wrong spirit, they will find nothing there. If they are by nature superficial, they will find in it only superficialities, and if profound, profundities in corresponding uh, measure. If they come arrogantly, they will interpret certain verses as justification for their arrogance. It is true it is true enough that the devil can recall the scripture, and if they seek immediate personal reward, they will be rewarded with bitter fruit. Uh, Jalaluddin Rumi compared the book to a bridge, unwilling to lift her veil before a rough... Oh, bride. Blech, I said a bridge. <laughs> compared the book to a bride unwilling to lift her veil before a rough and import an importunate lover and most Im Im and most important of all of of all are those who seek to plumb its depths without e without effort patience or humility it is no mere figure of speech to say that those who wish to win the quran win yet to win the quran must indeed woe it and the illiterate man who wears a verse around his neck as a talisman and who lovingly kisses the book he cannot read may be closer to the truth than is the casual reader. We are told that when Adam and Eve had been expelled from paradise, Adam received from his Lord words of revelation, and he accepted his repentance, for indeed he alone is the relenting, the merciful. We said, go down together from hence, but certainly there cometh to you guidance from me, and as for those who follow my guidance, no fear shall come upon them, neither shall they grieve. The precondition for receiving this guidance, or at least for profiting from it, is awareness of our need, awareness of the fact that we cannot hope to find our way across the landscape of our lives by the use of purely human faculties. For the Muslim, as for the Christian of earlier times, it is axiomatic that reason and logic to go to work on material provided in the most in the first instance by the creator to say this is to expose the triviality of modern thought philosophy and theorizing which attempt to operate in a vacuum dealing only with the facts of the physical of the physical environment if facts they are <clears throat> reason is not a source of knowledge but an instrument for dealing with knowledge it does not contain within itself any substance upon which <clears throat> it could operate pay okay yeah descartes a cogito ergo sum but works with material supplied from elsewhere by revelation intellectual intuition for the senses for us to be able to say this is true therefore that must follow this must be supplied to insist that reason is true to itself only when it operates on the observed phenomena of this world is to restrict its function inexcusably. 
The antithesis between revelation and reason, so frequently debated, is surely a false one. Reason does not become something different simply because it is put to work on information supplied supernaturally rather than by the physical senses. It is still the same faculty, and its function is unchanged. A knife is made for cutting substances. If no substance is provided, it remains unemployed and unemployable. And what is commonly described as rationalism has little to do with reason as such. It indicates no more than the assumption in itself irrational that only the objects of the senses uh, are real and that these alone are the proper objects of rational consideration. <clears throat> What is really at issue in the context of rationalism is a deep-seated conviction that only the physical senses provide information that is certain and unquestionable, a, con a conviction which uh, persists in the popular mind in spac uh, um, which persists in the popular mind in spite of the fact that science in this century has in its effect demolished the concept of solid matter as it is commonly misunderstood. This attitude of the mind has to do with that René Guénon described as solidification of the world and of the way in which the world is experienced. In the last days of our cycle of time, perhaps the first step towards faith in our age is a thoroughing skepticism, which pours its step towards faith, which, which pours its corro excuse me, yeah, which pours its corrosive acid upon false certainties <clears throat> and brings awareness that we are like swimmers in an ocean amidst waves which change our shape from the moment to moment and offer no hold to our grasping fingers. It is only, that, it is only when we are truly at sea when, uh, that we learn to distinguish between what is enduring and what is ephemeral. That's very poignant. Paul S., I appreciate that, man. Uh, Al Ghazali's later works on rational and, si and sentience cover this extremely well, the limits of the rational as well as the world that's forgotten by Muslims. <clears throat> Sooner or later, the course of considering Islam not only as it is as it is in itself unique and self and self sufficient, but also in relation to other religions, it becomes necessary to raise a question which admits of no simple answer: Who revealed the Quran? In other words, do Muslims believe in a personal God as Christians understand this term? To say that the answer depends upon what we mean by personal. Is it? is true enough, but does it take us very far, but does not take us very far, excuse me. The revealer of the Quran, <clears throat> Allah, is ultimately in, uh, indefinable within the categories of human thought, let alone those of language. Definitions apply to created things, and he is the creator. What his hands have made, and even the, even the use of the, words hand, of the word hands, immediately demonstrates that all talk of God is figurative and cannot grasp him. The most beautiful names applied to him in the Quran indicate aspects of his nature, but they do not tell us what he is in himself. No vision encompasses, encompasseth him, yet he encompasseth all vision. He is subtle and aware. Uh, an aspect of the Quran which the non-Muslim finds particularly confusing is its use of pronouns. The revealed speaker is as I, we, and he, and these pronouns are often uh, closely juxtaposed. He is one God, so that of me, so of me, he is one God, so of me stand in awe. Strictly speaking, such pronouns are applicable only to finite creatures. Just when, just when we are, just when we are ready in our anxiety to reduce him to a manageable concept, to settle upon a precise definition of the divine, he evades us. Having done so. Uh, he nonetheless permits us to approach him through concepts. According to a, to a Hadith Qudsi, one of the Prophet's sayings in which God spoke through him, I am as my servant thinks I am, and I am, and I am with him when he remembers me. An alternative translation of this immensely significant saying would be, I am with the opinion my servant has of me, and I am with him when he makes mention of me. The Andalusian mystic Ibn Arabi with the dare, with with a daring that has shocked the Orthodox ever since, said that the ordinary believer worship what the ordinary believer worships is an image he himself has made or projected, and that God in his mercy accepts to be present in this image. 
However distasteful this idea may be to many Muslims, it does preserve what might be called the divine anonymity while making God accessible to worship. For the Western unbeliever who has been persuaded that concepts of the divine, including God as such, are projections of the human mind, it may mind it may even be enlightening. In Islam, it cannot be said that God is not a person, for this would suggest that he is in some way less than this. Language offers no means of describing what is both personal and infinitely more than personal, which is why anthropomorphism is some sometimes called an illusion or indication, uh, or ishara. Uh, there is a subtle but very important distinction between an illusion on the one hand and on the other, a defini definition. The same might be said of the many Quranic references to God as seeing and hearing. Our human faculties of sight and hearing are indications, however remote, of something inherent in the divine nature, and yet they are no more than dim reflections of what is fully itself only in God. He sees everything, even so we are told, an ant under a rock on a dark night, whereas we see only what is before our eyes. With their, with their very limited range. He hears the rust, rustling of every leaf and the secret thoughts of his creatures. We hear only sounds that are either very loud or very close to us. We have the use of these faculties only because he has them, but uh, but we have them in so limited a form that only by courtesy can we be, can we be said to see and to hear. From the same point of view, it comes... It could be said that God is supremely a person, whereas our, whereas our personal identity trembles on the edge of disillusion, and it is only divine courtesy that permits us to say, I. In Christianity, as the Muslim sees it, <clears throat> God has been personalized, even humanized, to such a degree that this has become the dominant element in the religion. Profound ideas and the concept of the divine person is certainly profound, are eventually simplified to the point of crudity, and the Christian personalism has been one of the principal causes of unbelief and agnosticism in the modern age. For many people in the West, God loves me has been taken to mean that a person just like you and me, only more powerful, situated in some unimaginable place, loves us in the way human beings love. From this... <clears throat> From this, it is a very short step in asking how such a person can allow us to suffer as we do and why. If he is omnipotent, he has not created a perfect and pain-free world. There are, of course, no answers to such questions on the level in which they are asked. The Muslim, when he oversimplifies, tends to see God as a mighty king who does as he pleases for entirely inscrutable reasons and of whom we have no right to ask questions. This image may be no less inadequate than that of the loving and indulgent father, but in strictly practical terms, it seems to protect faith more effectively than does the contemporary Christian concept. The fact remains, however, that all the images we make, serviceable as they may be, to the human needs are inadequate and therefore vulnerable to the skeptic's arguments. Having asked who the revealer is, we may then ask to whom the revelation is given. Had we caused this Quran to descend upon a mountain, thou wouldst indeed have seen it humbled and cleft asunder from the fear of Allah. Such images do we, such images do we coin for mankind that perhaps they may reflect. But it descended upon a man, and he was not cleft asunder, since he was the predestined recipient of this knowledge. Inspiration comes from men diluted or as it were softened but revelation is naked power and in break of reality into the world of appearances nothing distinguishes man more clearly from the rest of creation than the fact that he alone of all things made is made is capable all things made is capable with withstanding this shock and absorbing the divine message into himself without being crushed <clears throat> Yet this is this is only one aspect of the burden which the human creature bears the burden one aspect of the burden which the human creature bears the burden which makes him human and he bears it not on account of some arbitrary divine decree but as something freely accepted we offered the trust amana to the heavens and the earth and the mountains but they demurred from bearing it and feared to do so it was man who bore it the mountains represent firmness and stability and are true to these qualities in which they are they were created. The earth, with all its variety, obeys the natural laws to which it is subject, and the heavens, whether as celestial place or as the realm of the angelic powers, obey the divine will and do not deviate from it. 
There have been many different opinions as to the precise nature of this trust, but in general, it represents those qualities which distinguish man from the rest of creation. Reflexive consciousness, a will that is relatively free, the capacity to choose between good and evil, and an awareness to which no limits are set. The supreme trust was given to the open-eyed creature, capable of choice, and, for that very reason, capable of betrayal. As such, he receives the revelation, and as such, he is shown the law of his being, not as animals receive it, th though through irresistible instinct, but as guidance which he may freely, freely accept or reject. When he betrays this trust, he has broken his word. The Quran speaks of what is known as the day of Alast, uh, and when thy Lord brought forth from the children of Adam from their loins their descendants, and made them testify concerning themselves, saying, I am not your Lord. Am I not your Lord? They said, Yeah, truly, we testify. And the passage concludes by explaining that this is lest you should claim on the day of resurrection that you were unaware of this, or lest you should claim our fathers ascribed partners to a law from ancient times, and we are descended from them. In other words, we have by our very nature, because we are what we are, committed ourselves even before our conscious life began. A great part of the Quran is devoted to the story or series of stories of the conflict between faith and infidelity, or between those who were true to this commitment and those who betrayed it. On the one hand, follow the unceasing struggle of Muhammad against the pagans of Mecca. On the other, we are told tales of earlier prophets, both Jewish and Arab, who brought the gift, the gift of revelation to their peoples and were rejected and persecuted. The great drama of God's self-revelation to the Semites is unfolded, and besides it, all profane history could be said to record little more than the scuffling of mice in a larder. It has been remarked as, the curios as a curiosity that one of the earliest Muslim historians devoted the major section of his history to the world to, the world to which the story of Yusuf, the biblical Joseph, while dismissing the rise and fall of the Roman Empire in a couple of pages. This order of priorities is entirely understandable, for the real history of humankind has little to do with the newspaper headlines or with the events that would make would have made headlines. There is an unobserved, almost unrecorded history that is ultimately more that is ultimately more significant than the succession of day-to-day -day events, which are soon scattered like ashes in the wind. Who now cares that such and such a great king lived and died long ago, whereas the story of the prophets is a timeless is timeless and is presented as such in the Quran with any indifference to chronology that has disturbed many Western Orientalists. <clears throat> they have been disturbed also by the apparent contradiction between the claim that Muhammad was unlettered and the inclusion in the Quran of stories and legends, sometimes of biblical origin, which were part of the cultural heritage of the Arabs. A false alternative is put forward, whether he received his knowledge directly from God or else he absorbed it from the milieu in which he lived. The Quran states explicitly that never did we send any messenger, save with the language of his people, that he might make the message clear to them. And in this case, the term language has made significance and means a great deal more than the collection of words used by the people concerned. It includes the images and thought forms, indeed the whole culture familiar to them, for only in this way can the message be clearly understood. The biblical stories in question, together with, a, with certain traditional Arab materials, such as the stories of uh, Hud and Salih, <coughs> Salih, were part of the milieu in which the Quranic message was embodied. Just as the revelation clothes itself in words that are common use, rather than in incomprehensible tongue, new minted for its purpose, so it makes use of illustrative stories found in the store of common knowledge. It is axiomatic in every religious context that God works with the materials available to him in a given milieu. Materials which are, in any case, his own creations. The Quran, as it exists in this world, though it is in though in its essence uncreated, is composed of out the out of the elements of this of the environment into which it was projected. Such as the spirit humanized clothes itself in the physical and psychic material uh, of the world into which has it has entered. The divine intention, however, is to save and remind mankind, not to provide us with historical information. All that we relate to thee concerning the messengers, 
is to strengthen thy heart thereby. And this has come to thee, the truth and a reminder for believers. In other words, their purpose is to confirm the message given to Muhammad in terms of continuity, demonstrating that there is nothing strange or outlandish in it, while at the same time calling to the mind that the persecution of earlier messengers and the unwillingness of mankind throughout history to face the truth and fulfill trust. It cannot be stressed too often, says Muhammad Asad, that narrative as such is never the purpose of the Quran. Whenever it relates the stories of earlier prophets or alludes to ancient legends or to historical events that took place before the advent of Islam or during the lifetime of the prophet, the aim is invariably a moral lesson. Since one and the same event or even legend usually has many facets revealing as many moral implications, the Quran reverts again and again to the same stories, but every time with a slight variation of stress uh, on this or that aspect of the fundamental truths underlying the Quranic revelation as a whole. Elsewhere, he adds that many-sided, many-layered truth underlying these stories invariably has a bearing on, this, on some of the hidden depths and conflicts within our own human psyche. The Quran is not a book of philosophy, but it is the source book of philosophy, not a treatise on psychology, but the key to a, psych to a psychology. Writing from an entirely different point of view, yet in perfect agreement with Assad, Syed Hussein Nasser, he's the one who basically compiled my study Quran, uh, remarks that the message couched in historical terms is addressed to the human soul. The hypocrite um, uh, who, who divides people and spreads falsehoods in the matters concerning religion also exists within the soul of every man, as does the person who has gone astray, or he who follows the straight path. All the actors on the stage of sacred, sacred history, as recounted in the Quran, are also symbols of the forces existing within the soul of a man. The Quran is, therefore, a vast commentary on man's terrestrial existence. It might well be, be asked what relevance to his own life the Muslim of the Middle Ages would have seen in the constant Quranic references to the Kafirun, the unbelievers or deniers, if he was unaware of this psychology or he was unlikely ever to have met such creatures, and unless he was a learned man, might well have supposed them to be extinct. <clears throat> Even in our time, a traveler in Arabia noted uh, recently that some Bedouin uh, with whom he talked in a remote part of the country thought that everyone in the world was a Muslim. <laughs> it had not occurred to them that there might still be Christians, let alone unbelievers, surviving in odd corners of the globe. The Muslim who follows the Quranic injunctions to think and to meditate knows that he harbors a variety of kafirun, kafirun within his own soul and that he must wage war on them if he is to survive as a man of faith. The Christian talks of doubts and sometimes treats them with respect. Are not all opinions worthy of respect? Whereas the Muslim is more likely to identify them as whisperings of the devil, whose habit it is, according to the last surah of the Quran, to whisper in the breasts of men. Aisha recounted how one night the prophet left her bed for a while and she was troubled. When he returned, he asked what was the matter with her and whether she was jealous. Why should someone like me not be jealous concerning someone like you, she asked. Your devil has come to you, he said, messenger of Allah. Have I a devil? He told her uh, that she had. He told her that she had. So she asked if he had one too. And he said, yeah, yes, he said, but Allah has helped me against him. This strikes a note with the Occident, which, which the Occidental with his Christian background finds strange and somehow out of place in the traditions of the prophet. When he meets with someone something similar in the text of the Quran, he is usually either astonished or shocked. He asks how it is possible to believe that the creator of the heavens and the earth uh, could concern himself in a revelation destined to transform the great sector of humanity with instructing the prophet's wives in their duty, warning Muhammad's dinner guests not to outstay their welcome or clearing a young girl of unjust suspicions. It is the last of these examples in the case of Aisha's necklace, which has been the focus of most derisory comments. According to traditional accounts of the incident, the Prophet was returning with his troops from a campaign in the sixth year after the immigration to Medina. They halted briefly in the desert, and on the final stage of their journey, Aisha left, left her litter to answer a call of nature. Returning to the encampment, she realized that she had lost her necklace of Yemenite ag uh, agates and went back to look for it. 
Uh, the time had come to break camp, and people who lifted her litter on the camel did not realize that she was no longer in it. Uh, the army continued on its way, leaving her behind. Finding herself abandoned, she sat down in the sand and fell asleep, and it was here that a young man following in the rear guard discovered her. Mounting her on his camel, he hurried on and caught up with the main body of the army. Tongues wagged and they, as they were bound to do, and those who resented her influence, or more probably, that of, her, that of her father, were quick to voice their suspicions, hostilities, and rivalries. Previously un, uh, unvoiced came to the surface, and the prophet himself was assailed with contradictory advice. His son-in-law, Ali, pointed out that troubles of this kind afflicted many households, and that there were, after all, plenty of other women in the world, a remark of which Aisha never forgave him. With far-reaching historical consequences, she herself, between fits of weeping, remained defiant. When Muhammad came to her, sad and deeply troubled, he said, uh, she told him, I know uh, what they are saying about me. You seem to believe it. I am like Jacob when he said, Patience is most becoming, and a law it is whose help is to be sought. A month passes, <clears throat> passed, a month during which the prophet received no further revelation. Uh, then Aisha's patience was rewarded, not through a dream which was the most uh, for which she had dared to hope, but in the verses contained in the surah called Light, a revelation which exonerated her and condemned her detractors who, told, who were told, when you, when you took it upon your, up with your tongues, utter, uttering with your mouth something of which you had no knowledge, you thought it a trifle. In the sight of Allah, it is something immense. Which, when this, with this came verses of legislation concerning accusations of adultery, which have remained valid forever after. An affair <clears throat> that might have seemed a mere trifle and might seem so still under different circumstances was shown to be something immense in the sight of God. Aisha could not have understood the, path, the vast dimensions of the stage upon which she had been summoned to play her part. But everything that happened upon this stage took place in so brilliant a light that had such tremendous consequences that we should not think it strange if God chose to intervene in the matter. Nor is it difficult with hindsight, aware of the significance of this incident in the development of Islam, to realize that the loss of a necklace by a 15-year-old girl traveling through an earthly desert might be of greater significance than galactic catastrophes or deaths of stars. <clears throat> Among the comedies of misunderstanding which can arise between men of different cultures, none is more frustrating than the situation in which two people say the same thing in almost the same words and mean quite different things by what they say. The Occidental, the, the Occidental looking, up, looking upon, look, bleh, 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 sorry guys, looking up at the night sky and reflecting on astronomical space will confess, sometimes with a shiver, how insignificant. Uh, he feels in the midst of such distances. The Muslim readily acknowledged, acknowledges his insignificance before, uh, before God, but he never uh, feels alone in an alien universe. The Muslim will also say that the natural world has, was created for man. The Occidental agrees with enthusiasm and proceeds to tear up the earth with his bulldozers. The Muslim does not feel dwarfed by the immensities of nature because he knows himself to be the vice-regent of God standing upright in the midst of these immensities. We, though small in stature, see the stars. They do not see us. We hold them within our consciousnesses and measure them in accordance with our knowledge. They know us not. We master them in our courses. Immensity cannot know itself. Only in human consciousness can such a concept exist. In this... In this sense, man is the eye of God and is therefore the measure of all things. And they, far from being alien and therefore menacing, have existence within our awareness of them, and there are therefore like extensions of our being. Yeah, Gaiin is an incredible writer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As to the world <clears throat> being made for man... The Muslim means by this that it is like a vast picture book through which God communicates with his vice regent, the observer of the universe, and with him alone. He has no inclination to tear this picture book to pieces like an unruly child. The Quran and the great phenomena of nature are twin manifestations of the divine act of self-revelation. For Islam, the natural world in its totality is a vast fabric into which the signs of the Creator are woven. 
it is significant that the word meaning signs or symbols, ayat, is the same word that is used for the verses of the Quran, earth and sky, mountains and stars, oceans and forests, and the creatures they contain are, as it were, verses of a sacred book. Gave me chills just reading that. <laughs> indeed, Allah, <clears throat> indeed, Allah disdaineth not to coin the similitude of a gnat or of something even smaller than that. Creation is one, and he who created the Quran is also he who created all the visible phenomena of nature. Both are a communication from God to man. In your creation, in all the beasts scattered on the earth, there are signs from people of sure faith. In the alt. In the alternative of night and day, what happened? <laughs> it's just like carrying a basket in here. It's just going, uh, uh, uh. What is it? Your knee hurt? No. You got an alley on your knee from yesterday with a monkey? Yes. You poo poo? No, yeah, you did. I can smell it. <laughs> Let me, uh, he's offering her gifts. Yeah, it's like a basket full of toys. So, yeah, she said, she said, sorry, daddy, when she brought it in. So, I think it's a peace offering. But I do have to change her diaper because, who boy, did she bring in a wretched stench when she came in here. <laughs> so, give me a sec, guys. That was pretty lofty reading. So, I could use a little break after that as well.
How did he do that for oh did a little sub um little sub indicator go off? Yeah, I set up in a set up some alerts. Oh yeah, water five four four five four two. Oh my goodness, dude. These comments. These comments. <clears throat> okay. Oh, all right, where are we? In your creation and in all the beasts scattered on the earth, there are signs for people of sure faith. In the alter, in the alternation of night and day, and in the provision Allah seat, sendeth down from the heavens, whereby he quickeneth the earth after its death. And in the distribution of the winds are signs for people who are intelligent. And truly in the creation of the heavens and of the earth, and the succession of night and day, and in the ships which speed through the sea, which what is useful to man, and the waters which Allah sendeth down from the heavens, and, and in the order of the winds, and, and the clouds that run their appointed courses between heaven and earth, are signs indeed for the people who are intelligent. 
because he he it is who hath spread the earth wide and placed in it a firm mountains and water and running waters and created therein two sexes of many kinds uh, of uh, oh, of plant and causeth the night to cover the day truly in all of this are signs for people who reflect uh, whether we can whether we scan great distances or look within ourselves the message is the same we shall show them our signs on the horizons and within themselves until they are assured that this is the truth. Doth not thy Lord suffice thee, since he is over all things the witness? The view of the natural world as a book is familiar in Occidental poetry, but this image is usually figurative, if not fanciful for sentimental. For the Muslim, it is, it is fact. It is... Yeah, it is fact, as sure as the, uh, as the fact that a man has two eyes and a nose. Whether we can read these signs or not, their presence all around us is something concrete, like writing on a page. Uh, another way of putting this would be to say that for Islam, there is nothing that does not have a meaning, and these meanings are not isolated words on the, on the page. They are coherent and interconnected, and it may be mentioned in passing that the ancient science of astrology is founded not on the improbable notion that the stars and the planets influence human lives, but upon the belief that we and we and they are part of a single pattern, and that a relationship necessarily exists between the different elements which make up the pattern. This leads directly to the key concept of Tawhid, sometimes translated as monotheism. and occasionally treated as an alternative des uh, designation for the religion of Islam. The root, uh, I don't know what that's supposed to be pronounced as, WHD, has the meaning of both unity and the act of unification. Wahada means he was unique. When the H is doubled and the verb doubled, the verb means he united or he made into one. And Wahid is one. Uh, wa Wadania is solitude, and uh, Muwahid is a monotheist, and, and Mutawatid, Mutawahid is a so, is a solitary. Since the basic theme of Islam is the oneness of God and the unity of His creation, it is obvious that the terms derived from this root are at the heart of the religion. The principle of Tawhid is demonstrated by the unity of the very substance of the universe and from the farthest galaxies to our own bodies and everything we handle uh, as it is by the physical laws which govern them. Whatever may, the perce may, may be perceived or surmised about the inner structure of matter, its ultimate nature is a mystery known only to the knower of the unseen and the apparent. What can be clearly seen is that the entire natural world is a single fabric of innumerable threads and that the lives of all the creatures in it depends directly or indirectly upon the light of the sun and the outpouring of the water, just as all depend from one moment to the next upon the divine light and the outpouring of vivifying grace. Being is one, and all that has being, that all that has being participates in this oneness. There is no way in which being could not be divided into separate and sealed compartments, for such a compartment would at once fall back into nothingness. Modern man has taken the road to death precisely because in his study and, as his, and his treatment of the natural world, he has acted as though such divisions existed. In all living things, as, as also in the very substance of rocks and soil, we see that unfold, we see that unfolding, see the unfolding of uh, chemical cycles depending upon the interaction between the sun's heat, the atmosphere, and the oceans. In all of them, the role of water is crucial, and this is the substance most frequently mentioned in the Quran. Allah created out of water every creature. Allah createth uh, what he will. Behold, Allah is over all things, all determining. Water is shown as the life-giving symbol of blessing, mercy, fecundity, and purity, and in the cycle of its movements, ascended to form clouds and ascended and descending as rain, it is the supreme intermediary between what is above and what is beneath. The prophet's close companion Anas reported a shower of rain fell on, f fell when we were up with the messenger of Allah, and he removed his garment until some of the rain fell upon him. We asked him why he did this, and he replied, "Because it has so reached between, uh, has so recently been with its Lord." 
The transformations of water, the only substance we find in its natural state in the three forms of solid, liquid, and vapor, in themselves constitute a message. We think of it as cool, yet it is unique in its capacity to store heat. The placid surface of a lake is a common symbol of peace and quietude, yet water is transformed into lashing rain, uh, tempestuous seas, and flood-swollen rivers. In the Far East, it is a symbol of humility, yet it is not inert, and without and without it, the chemistry of life would be impossible. For the Muslim, it is the great purifying agent which washes away even the most deeply rooted sins, and it has been chosen by God to be in intimately associated with our prayers through the ablution which precedes them. Do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and earth were of one piece before we clove them asunder, and we made from water every living thing? Will they not then believe? Oh, really? Wahid is also a name he didn't say because the Buddhists also do it? Gotcha. <laughs> if the term science has any precise meaning relating uh, relating it to knowledge uh, of the of the real, then it is the science of Tawhid, it could be said, and with good reason, that the Kafir uh, uh, should never be permitted to approach the physical sciences or to involve himself in them. He does not possess the key to them, and he is therefore bound to go astray and lead others astray. He divides when he should unite, and his fragmented mind deals only with fragments. It is little wonder uh, that he splits the atom with devastating results. Those who know nothing of the principles are incompetent to study its manifestations. Pursue not that of which thou hast no knowledge. Surely hearing and sight and heart, all these shall be called to account. Although signs may be found in everything that comes to us as through as though a river at our doorstep carried these messages on its surface, the Quran, like other sacred books, speaks in terms of empirical experiences, since it is intended to endure through the ages and cannot bind itself to the scientific theories of any particular time. Its images are, are the phenomena of nature, and they appear to us in our experience. The rising and setting of the sun, the dome sky above the mountains, which are like weights upon the earth, set upon the earth. Scientific observations change according to the preconceptions of the observer and the instruments at his disposal, and the speculations which blinkered human minds construct on, construct on the basis of these observations change no less swiftly. But man's experience of the visual universe does not change. The sun rises for me today as it rose for the men of 10,000 years ago. Symbolism resides also in the incidents and patterns of our experience, but it is less easily found in the underside of things, the mechanism by which they are brought about. A clock is a clock. The hands moving on its face convey information. Its inner works do not tell us the time. To be fully aware of this flood of messages requires a closeness to the natural world that is uncommon in our time. And the man who is wholly indifferent to nature is much like the man who is deaf to the Quran. Not only is he separated from the world about him, but he is inevitably divided within himself. The French writer Jacques, Jacques Ellul, uh, whose book La Technique, is amongst the most profound and perceptive critiques of the modern world published in this century, has remarked as many, other time, as many others that the sacred has always been an experience related to nature, to the phenomena of birth, death, regeneration, the lunar cycles, and so on. Man who leaves that milieu is still imbued with the feelings of imagery derived from the sacred, but these are no longer revived and rejuvenated by experience. The city person is separated from the natural environment, and, as a consequence, the sacred significance, uh, significations no longer have any point of contact with experience. They soon dry up for lack of support in man's new experience with the artificial world of urban technology. The artificial, the systematized, and the rational seem incapable of giving birth to an experience of the same order. He adds that it, 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 that it was in relation to the forest, the moon, the ocean, the desert, the storm, the sun, the rain, the tree, that the sacred was ordered. And elsewhere he defines the sacred in relation to man as the guarantee that he is not thrust out into an illogical space and an endless time. The novelty of our era, he says, is that man's deepest experience is no longer with nature. Man in the presence and at the heart of the technical milieu feels the urgent need to get his bearings, to discover meaning and an origin, an authenticity in this inauthentic world. 
The outcome, he says, is a sacralization of society, as also uh, as also of the masters of desacralization in our modern era, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. While political manifestos replace sacred scriptures, when blood begins to flow and the broken bodies pile up and a new idolatry more deadly than the old demands human sacrifice. To save him from falling into this trap, the Muslim needs the Quran, but he also needs its complement, the revelation written in natural phenomena. Without this, much of the Quran is incomprehensible. The sacred rites of Islam, in particular, the five daily prayers and the month of fasting, are intimately related to the natural cycles, rather than to the mechanical time. The times of prayer are determined by the breaking of dawn, the raising of the sun, its coming to the zenith, its mid-decline, sunset, and the close of the day. And although the calendar tells us when the month of Ramadan begins and ends, it is considered essential that the dates should be established by the physical sighting of the new moon so that the lived experience takes precedence over all scientific calculation. What, sweetheart? Your arm gets stuck? You gotta take it off? You have to take your dress off? There. Why do you want it off like that? Crazy. Give me your arm. Boop, boop, boop. Thank you. Come here. Why do you want it off like this, crazy? Boop. And that's how you want it? <laughs> you want off all the way? Okay, hold on. Come here. Baby, is that better? I love you. Is that better? Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. Oh, thank you for liking me. Okay, baby, I love you, baby. No, don't touch those. That's not good for you. No, don't don't touch those. <laughs> yeah, you want to though, if I can see it. <laughs> Maybe I'm a clothes designer, a designer one day. <laughs> Those are waters, yeah. Those are all waters. What? <laughs> Let me see how much longer we got to go. Quite a while still. This is a long one. What, well, sweetheart? I do see you. Yes, I see you. Yes, sweetheart, I see you. I'm looking right at you. Isn't that funny? Try dancing. <laughs> oh. All right, guys. I to that that might be all I've got today, unfortunately. Yeah, I see you dancing. That might be all I've got today with the baby being like she is. So it looks like there's a quite a bit way, quite a ways to go still. Eighty five. Let's just see here. Where's the next chapter? Lot to get through still. Jeez. Chapter five. We're all, we are almost halfway. If we can get to page one ten, that would put us about halfway through the whole book. Or. Where is it saying chapter five starts? It says chapter five, the messenger of God. Where's that at? Maybe over this weekend? Yeah. I mean, I'll be able to read tomorrow too, but we just might have to put it in a smaller. Yeah, through the whole book. Where's the fifth chapter here start? Oh, right. Oh, there it is. Oh, no, we're, we're really not that far. Um...
How's it going? It's going good, BH. Yeah, we're like right where, right about here, 85. So we have five more, four more pages. All right, we can try to get through it, I think. To get through the next chapter. <clears throat> All right, power through. The sacred rites of Islam, in particular, the five daily prayers. Oh, yeah, we already read this. Uh, and the oh, calendar tells us... Duh, 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 duh. A computer. <laughs> the natural world was compared earlier to a picture book. <clears throat> it must now be added that this book, this is a book filled with life and activity and that these pictures leap out from the page. Their activity is praise and their life is nourished and sustained by the divine mercy. Seest thou not that it is Allah whom all things in the heavens and earth praise and the birds in flight outstretched. Each knoweth, knoweth its mode of prayer and praise to him and Allah is aware of all that they do and again the seven heavens and the earth are all that they contain uh, praise him nor is there anything that does not celebrate his praise uh, though ye understood not their praise behold he is clement forgiving and hast thou not seen that unto Allah prostrate themselves whatsoever is in the heavens and whosoever is in the earth the sun and the moon and the stars and the hills and the trees and the beasts of many mankind According to a hadith, Muhammad told his people that there was once a prophet who was stung by an ant and therefore ordered that a colony of ants should be burned. And God reproached him, because an ant stung thee, thou hast burned a community which glorified me. All creatures and all phenomena are instructed in their courses and guide towards the fulfillment of their destiny, which is their place in the universal pattern. And thy Lord inspired the bee, choose for thyself dwellings in the mountains and in trees and in what men build, then eat of all fruits and follow humbly the path, thy paths, the paths of thy Lord made smooth. The praise which ascends from all creation reflects as through as though in mirrors beyond number, the mercy which descends from heaven and which brought everything into being. Natural beauty and the nourishment uh, which keeps all living creatures in existence together with the rain which, uh, which revives, revives the dry earth are the most frequently quoted examples of the operations of this mercy. The earth, he set it, in, he set it down for living creatures and in it are, are fruit and date palms with their sheaths, the grain that with its fodder leaf and the fragrant herbs, which then of thy Lord's benefactions will ye both gainsay. And so let man look upon his nourishment, how we pour out the pouring rain and split the furrowed earth, and therein gra grow grain and grapes and clover, olives and palms, orchards rich with trees and fruit uh, and provender, a ministration for, for you and your flocks. Here again, the principle of Tawheed is but thinly veiled by multiplicity, for all creatures are sustained by flood by food exchange between them in a vast web of mutual dependence, in which both competition and cooperation play their part. The death of one of one being, the life of another, the gift of one being, the sustaining of another or of many. This fragile web of mutual dependence within which all creatures exist, protected from lethal radiation only by the thin coverlet of the atmosphere, is situated in a precarious confine between the unknowable extent of the cosmos and the impenetrable depths, depths of the earth with its fiery interior. But, uh, uh, both above and within these physical realms of the unknown is the greater unknown, beyond the firmament and beneath the deepest layers of our existence. Within this narrow confine, vulnerable as we are, we must tread carefully upon the earth, treating it with the same respect that we, sh that we show the to the book of Allah. For although he hath made the earth humbled to you, and although we are free to walk in its tracks and eat of its providing, yet are we assured of him that is in heaven that he might not cause the earth to swallow you. For behold, the earth is shaking or is quaking. Again and again, the Quran reminds us of the fragility of all that exists. The vegetation which springs into life under the blessings of rain is soon cut down and becomes a straw. Even the mountains, images of stability, are precarious. And thou seest the mountains which thou deemest so firm pass away as clouds pass away. 
The alterations, alternations of life and death, like those of night and day, are a, as a shadowy play in which nothing endures under the moon, that inexorable timekeeper which, after waxing, returns like an aged sickle branch of a palm. Yet the transience of all things, nothing enduring, nothing exempt from death, has a positive aspect. <clears throat> For it is precisely with fragility uh, that makes the thin screen of existence transparent to what lies beyond it. Were it solid, it would be opaque. Even in the simplest human level, no man would think of God if he did not know that he has to die. Beyond the multiplicity of created phenomena and the apparent endlessness of space and time stands Allah, the one after the mention of whose name the pious Muslim adds, glorified be he and far above all association, veiled, so it is sometimes said, by 70,000 veils of light and of darkness. For, for, were, for were, were he to show himself plain, unveiling his majesty over the world, everything would dissolve in the instance, as would this earth if brought close to the sun. For a little while, then, we are free to wander in a kind of twilight, and even with an, an illusion of safety, obedient to the revealed law or disobedient, as the case may be, blind and deaf to the truth, if we chose to be so. In this way, we commit ourselves, identify ourselves, demonstrating openly who and what we are, and very soon our little while is over, and we come to judgment. One of the subsidiary names sometimes given to the Quran is al Khan. Uh, derived from the verbal root meaning he separated and usually translated as the discrimination or the criterion. This book identifies the book as a sort of discrimination which cuts through the confusion in human experience between truth and falsehood as also between good and evil. In a chaotic environment, people live out their lives in a kind of gray zone in which all distinctions are blurred. The Quran warns repeatedly that the coming of a messenger with a revelation from heaven is like a foretaste of the last judgment, after which there can be no excuses for remaining in a state of uncertainty. Revelation casts upon the whole scene a brilliant light in which everything can be seen as it is and assigned to its proper place. There is no coercion in religion. The right way is henceforth distinct from error. He who rejecteth the powers of evil and believeth in Allah hath indeed grasped a firm handhold. We are told that thy Lord would never destroy a community for their wrongdoing, so long as they were unaware. But for every people there is a messenger, and when their messenger hath come, it will be judged between them fairly, and they will not be wronged. However neutral an individual may appear to be so long, However neutral an individual may appear to be so long as he is in an undifferentiated milieu and however obscure his fundamental tendencies, while he is in this milieu, these tendencies are actualized on contact with the light of revelation. Just as the brightness of physical light brings out the potential contrasts, so spiritual light gives each thing the primary qualities of positive or negative value. The messenger says, in effect, I have been sent to warn you. Now choose and live forever with the consequences of your choice. Which is no doubt why it is said that when the gates of paradise are open, the gates of hell open likewise. It is the words of the popular American phrase we are invited to hear the truth before it bites you. One of the fundamental themes of the Quran is a man's flight from reality. Given the basic premise that God is, and that his being both transcends and encompasses all of existence, then unbelief is, in precisely, such, is precisely such a flight. Men and women throughout the centuries have tried ev at every opportunity uh, to evade total reality. Oh, yeah? <laughs> you gonna hmm me in the chat? You gonna hmm me in the chat, wife? Eh? This is my w this is my wife, guys. Thumbs up in the chat for my wife saying hmm in chat. <clears throat> <laughs> Even at the simplest everyday level, there is constant avoidance of the thought of death. There is evasion of our inward solitariness, which no amount of conviviality can entirely overcome and there is a refusal to acknowledge our limitations and our sins not only is the innate tendency is he neglecting his duties are we keeping him <laughs> not only is it the innate tendency of fallen man to forget god but there comes about a luxuriant growth of forgetfulness in every sphere the sword of the quran cuts also through the dreams which hold men and women in their in their net even when outward circumstances like a shower of ice cold water might persuade them to open their eyes to reality dreams the last refuge of the would-be escaper still cling when all other temptations have lost their grip on the soul 
In the words of the Christian author Gustav Thibben, it is not against sleep, but against the dream that we must fortify ourselves. When one who, one who dreams is more difficult to awaken than one who sleeps. Sleeps is the absence of God. Sleep is the absence of God, but the dream is his phantom image. And God is doubly absent in the, in the dream. First, because his place is empty. Second, because it is occupied by something that is not he. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, less for those who sleep than for those who dream. Sounds definitely low. Let me try. Here, let me try turning it up a little bit. In my ear, is the sound a little bit low? Okay. Okay, very high now. Okay, there we go. I just had to turn up the gain just slightly. I didn't want to like max out the sound, so. Okay, so the gain should be right at that like first dot, not down below that. Like I said, since I got the pop filter, things have altered a little bit, so I apologize. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay, yeah. There are moreover a number of passages in the Quran which expose what might be considered a typically modern illusion. <clears throat> the belief that we can, as it were, sl slip quietly away and not be noticed so long as we do not draw attention to ourselves and so long as we live, according to our own opinion, a decent and harmless life. It is the tearing away of all such illusions of security that characterizes both the last judgment and its anticipation in the Quran. And this is the background against which all life is seen as brief, but immensely precious, a brief, but immensely precious opportunity offering a once and for all choice. Hence the sense of urgency, which informs the whole Quran, making the very thought of past times an outrage against common sense. For to waste the little time we have seems to the Muslim like insane profligacy. Prof profligacy? The common plea of those described in the Quran as the losers, uh, those who face damnation, is to be sent back, if only for a short while, to human life. And one understands that even a single day in which to make a good use of time would be, for them, a treasure beyond anything they desired while living. So warn mankind of the day when the punishment comes to them and the wrongdoers exclaim, Our Lord, grant us respite for a short while. We will obey thy call and follow thy messenger. The messenger. Both Quran and Hadith emphasize the helplessness of those who have died and who are going through the period of trial or questioning which come which culminates in the judgment. And it is in contrast to this that the supreme privilege of living is seen as that of free movement and opportunity. This freedom is a mercy from heaven and an aspect of the trust according to man. For had we so willed, we would have indeed have fixed them in their place, leaving them powerless to go forward or to turn back. Just as the paraplegic will remember uh, the days when he could put on put one foot in front of the other as a time of unappreciated happiness, so do the dead look back upon their former agility, which is why it is often said in Islam that only the dead know the value of life. And once judgment is pronounced, regret and repentance have no further function. Whether we rage, uh, whether we rage or patiently endure is now all one to us. We have no refuge. This aspect of the matter is already familiar to the Christian who reads in St. Luke's Gospel of the day when they, become, when they begin to say the mountains fall upon us and to hills cover us, and who learns from the book of Revelation that in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. When the warnings have been given, the rules laid down, the stories told, and all the images coined, when the Quran turns to the moment, when the sun is folded up, and when the stars are darkened, and the mountains pass away, and when the seas boil over, and when the scrolls are laid open, and the sky is torn away, and when hell is kindled, and when the garden is brought close, then shall every soul know what, is, what it, ha it has prepared for, the, for itself." When that moment comes, mankind will be as thickly scattered moths as the uh, and the mountains as carded wool, and all that is hidden and deeply buried in the patient earth from the beginning of time to the end of time will be made apparent. When the earth is shaken with her convulsion and the earth casts up her burdens, on that day she will declare her tidings for her for her Lord and will enlight have enlightened her. 
This is in the inbreak of the real and the destruction of the entire fabric of the dream in which we have lived. That will be the day of reality. Therefore, let whoso will take a straight return to his Lord. We have indeed warned you of a penalty that is close. The day when men when man will see uh, what his hands have wrought, and the unbeliever will say, Woe unto me, would, I, would that I were dust. That moment, <clears throat> although chronologically at the end of time, overshadows the present almost as the almost as though it were in sight, because the real necessarily overshadows what is less real, and because the timeless is always in a certain sense here and now, moreover, each individual death is, for the individual concerned, a prefiguration of the end of all things under the sun. Even uh, even believers themselves, says Friedolf Schuon, are the, for the most part too indifferent to feel con concretely that God is not only above in heaven, but also ahead of us at the end of the world, or even simply at the end of our own lives, that we are drawn through life by an inexorable force, and at the end of the course God awaits us. The world will be submerged and swallowed up one day by an unimaginable eruption of the purely miraculous, unimaginable because surpassing all human experience and standards of measurement. Man cannot possibly draw on his past to bear witness to anything of this kind, and more than any mayfly may, may uh, expatiate on the alternation of the seasons, the rising of the sun can in no way enter into the habitual sensations of a creature born at midnight, whose life will, uh, will last but a day. But it is thus that God will come. There will be nothing but this one advent, this one presence, and by it the world of experiences will be shattered. Each of us in his little corner is a participant in a drama, both cosmic and metacosmic, beside which the greatest earthly convulsions of storm and hurricane of earthquake and volcanic eruption are little more than the shifting of theatric scenery, of theater scenery. But the dominant theme which runs through the Quran. Hi, sweetheart. <laughs> From this beginning to end is the mercy of God in whose hands. Yeah, I see it in whose hands even such a, a, such a drama as this is but a small thing. And if it were assured that those would have grasped the firm handhold, offered to them have nothing to fear. At journey's end is the greeting, thou, O thou soul at peace, return. Hang on, sweetheart. I'm almost done, I promise. Almost done, okay? Boop. At the journey's end is the greeting, O thou soul at peace, return unto thy Lord, con content in his contentment, as for such he hath inscribed faith upon their hearts, and strengthened them with a spirit from himself, and he will bring them into gardens, beneath which flow rivers of grace therein to abide. Allah is content with them, and they are content with him. And that's it. That's it. Thank you for getting that filter. It works like a time. Yes, sweetheart. All right, you guys, that will conclude our reading. I made it just barely. Um, thank you for your time. I'll uh, I'll continue this tomorrow. Like I said, blessed Lent and blessed Ramadan for my Catholic and uh, Muslim friends. So I'll talk to you guys soon. Until then, be well. And God be with us all.